And welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me I have a newcomer to the temple, coming to us straight from Lion Banner Games, who at who has a wealth of, of battle maps in the fantasy and cyberpunk genre in in their um, repertoire, and now making their venture into doing development with with 5e through Tomb of the Colossus Gods, the one and only Richard Carroll. How are you doing today, man? Thank you very much. Great, great intro, Mildra. <laughs> yeah, as I, as I've mentioned in the past, I try and I try and go I try and go and bomba go bombastic to start things off. Without get in a way that won't get me sued by the Buffer family. Okay, okay. <laughs> it's a pleasure to be here with you. Uh, so, I like to start at the humble beginnings in, in these sort yes. of things. So, with that in mind, what I'd like you to walk me through your first introduction to role-playing games and what was it that made it stick? Well, I've actually uh, been a fanatic of actually all everything fantasy, from Conan the Barbarian to Lord of the Rings. I've been a big fan of everything I could get my hands on, fantasy, reading books and all that. And I've actually grown up in Spain. I've actually, and it's actually been very hard to find people to play actually role-playing games here. So what I've had to do is just consume, consume lots of content over the years. And, you know, I think I've actually creating my own content was actually a way for me to actually you know, explore the artistic part and create these battle maps and write content. So that's why I'm here today, you know, presenting Tomb of the Colossus Gods. Mm -hmm. And that bring that brings me to a, quest to a question with um, Tomb of the Colossus Gods is is built as a is built as a dark fantasy. Um, yes. So for you, what what's the appeal with with that particular subtype? Well, I've always been interested in uh, dark, mature themes, always. Like I said, I've always, I've always enjoyed the Conan stories and other dark fantasy as well out there. Mm -hmm. And I just think there's something very appealing about uh, always like maybe an evil wizard, dark cults, dangerous tombs and dungeon crawling. I think that's very appealing to people. And it's always attracted me for content. And when I design my maps and I write, I always seem to be attracted to writing dark fantasy. Now, with now with that in with that in mind, as I as I understand it, we're do, you're doing both a you're doing both a setting, as well as as well as a module. Um, yes. Now now, on the Kickstarter page, it said that it's that the modules t will take place from first to tenth level and beyond. How yes. far, how far is that beyond going? Well, that all depends now on the playtesting. We've got a great, good, great uh, group of playtesters uh, that would actually help us with the campaign. So as we get through all the writing of the book, because only about half of it's actually done, Mildred, half mm -hmm. of the book has been written. Until the rest of the half of the book, the other half is done, we won't know actually to which level beyond we'll reach. But it will take actually heroes from, like we said, level one, and it will take them through everything. They'll be gaining new abilities, learning spells, uh, they'll be gaining weapons. We've invented all new, brand new weapons for the campaign. So I think the people are, I think people are going to maybe enjoy this campaign, you know? Mm -hmm. And given, given the multiple locations, not just the, not just the battle map, but the multiple areas that, yes, th that this, that this, um, adventure go goes through, it definitely get, it definitely gives that vibe of, of something long form because you've got, you've got deep well, which, is definitely leaning into that urban that urban fantasy approach, especially with all of the factions. Um, the land the land of decay, also known as Arizona. <laughs> yes, definitely inspired by Arizona. <laughs> <laughs> and the and the eight and the ageless city, or as uh, um, not to not to not to make too many jokes and jokes within my home country, but. When my when my colleague and I for, for first going through this, um, yes. as soon as he saw the Ageless City, he said, "Look, it's the lost city of Atlanta." Okay, okay. <laughs> there's probably some inspiration there as well. I'm sure um, there's things I've learned over the years in Atlantis, uh, Atlantis more than Atlanta, <laughs> Mildred. Yeah. I he I know he I know he was going for Atlantis. He just he just yes. wanted, he just likes doing that kind of thing to rile me up. 
And my city of Deepwell is actually, since I, I come from cyberpunk creating content as well, it's sort of my dystopian city of fantasy. You know, it is like a cyberpunk city. Mm -hmm. It's this underground massive city where people are actually, the few, you know, control the many. Mm -hmm. So it is like a sort of dystopian feel, the city of Deepwell, and the players are going to have uh, many quests to do there involving uh, gangs, a consortium that controls the mines. Uh, many, many quests are actually in deep well, and it'll give them a good start. With at least the first five levels of the players will be in deep well. Mm -hmm. And of course, of course, with the it is fu it is funny that we bring up Atlantis when it comes to the Ageless City, given given all given all of the all the all the different takes on Atlantis within within popular culture just in the last forty years. Um, yes, a lot, and as well as as well as the uh, as well as the fact that, um, if one goes back and actually reads Plato's Republic, it's not too far removed from a Hollywood blockbuster. No, there's a uh, you know all, all inspiration in history like Atlantis, and I, actually I I grew up in the Canary Islands, which are these islands off the coast of Africa that are part of Spain. And actually, some uh, some historians believe actually maybe that was actually the inspiration that area where where I grew up. Actually, the, in those seven islands called the Canary Islands actually maybe inspiration for Atlantis as well. There's that's certainly a possibility. I'm not I'm not I'm not saying that. And there's there's o there's other possibilities as as well. That's the that's the tricky thing when tr when trying to find an origin point when you're dealing with. When you're dealing that far back, there, it's uh, it's it's less of an origin point and more of a general ballpark. Yes, yes, definitely. Um, but the when I look at when I look at the way that it's the way that it's set up with the with the whole with the whole idea of of finding these cha finding these chambers of Col of um Colossus gods, um. I don't know. I don't know why, but I get a very race against time kind of kind of vibe. Definitely, you've just hit on the mark there, Mildred. Of course, the whole idea, part of the themes of the story, is uh, this quest of immortality and what price has to be paid for it. Mm -hmm. Because the uh, citizens of the Ageless City, I'm not going to tell all the story, but the s some event happened which granted them immortality to all the citizens. But of course, that came at great cost. They, they had to pay and sa literally sacrifices to the Colossus gods that delve deep the, below their city. And these are bloodthirsty gods that, you know, that uh, they didn't understand what was the actual cost when they got uh, gained this ability, this gift of immortality. Mm -hmm. So the part of the players will be, will be this race against time to beat the evil wizard, the mage Kalashrum on my story, and, 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 gain access to these chambers of the Colossus gods and try and restore time to the city, the Ageless City, and stop the evil wizard, you know, Kalashramo, from actually awakening these Colossus gods and becoming one himself, part of them, and, you know, wrecking incredible havoc, of course. Mm -hmm. Now, with the... Now, even, with, even within that, there, it looks. It looks like there are. It looks like there are some player-facing additions that you're also that you're also um, adding adding into the fray. Um, chief um, chief among them that I did that I did want to cover yes. is the three is the three classes that are that you're uh, bring, that you're bringing in. Um, yes. And... There will actually be six classes, Mildred. Six classes, and then we've already shown a preview of three, but there will be more. Mm -hmm. So I w I would like to focus on those for on those three that have been revealed to kind of get kind of get a feel for what they bring to the proverbial sandbox in terms of their place. Yes. Starting with the Crusader. Yes, uh, basically what I wanted to do with creating uh, actually these new sort of classes was to create classics that were thematically linked to the story as well. I wanted to create uh, classes that would actually be relevant to the story and this land of decay that the players are going to explore. Mm -hmm. And the Crusader class, of course, is your typical tank class that can also uh, has part healing and also has a few dis very destructive powers, Mildred. Mm -hmm. um, in that regard, how similar or different would they be to the Paladin? 
there would be some similarities, but I've all the powers that were created in all the different levels up to the twentieth level, mm -hmm. such as the War Cry, Celestial Armor, all these features that we've created, they're completely different. We've invented those completely. Obviously, the basic uh, essence of the class is it's a big tank uh, with they can actually cure themselves. They've got uh, tremendous power and have a bit of magic. Mm -hmm. But uh, the idea of all the powers that we've created for this is actually so that they're linked against uh, the enemies and relevant to the story we've created. Mm -hmm. And when I, I looked at the I looked at the um, at the development chart for the for the Crusader in the preview. Um, yes. Would it be? Would it be fair of me to say that they that they end up getting they end up getting their subclass um, significantly earlier? Definitely, yes. Right away on level one, mm -hmm. uh, the crusader will choose a set of ideals. They can choose to be a crusader of the gods, mm -hmm. or they can be a crusader of justice, and this will grant them uh, either a boon and a peril, depending on which choice they they select. Mm -hmm. Now. The disciple of ruin, just from the art alone, I get, I, I get that it's going to be is going to be one of the casters. Um, Definitely. Yeah. But there's a lot. But there's a lot of there's a lot of there's a lot of wiggle room when it comes to how to do a caster. Uh, what do you mean? Sorry, not not understanding what you mean. Well, in the in the same in this. Wizards and wizards and sorcerers are both are both ca are both casters, but the but yes, it's within what it's within what they do what they do with that casting ability that that separates them. Ah, yes. Well, disciple of ruin is really our sort of sorcerer class, and it's going to be a uh, very destructive. All the all the magic and all the features that they're going to gain on the on each level. Right now, like I said to you, we've previewed on the Kickstarter the Crusader class, but as the campaign continues of the Kickstarter, we will be releasing more information on the Disciple of Ruin and the Marauder and the other classes that we have as well. Yeah. Uh, the the Marauder, based on the way it, based on the way it's described, I, I keep getting this vibe of a of a more combat centric uh, rogue. Uh, definitely, yes. Definitely, the, that was our idea for that one, yes. Uh, we wanted actually a, a stealth character um, that a hero could play stealthily, but also could actually have a good melee melee combat fighting against the Acolytes and all the other Crusaders that are in the story in the Land of Decay. Yeah, and in the same vein that is based on what you described me with the Disciple of Ruin, the archetype of the old Blaster Caster seems to fit them. Yes. Oh. Uh. And of, co of course, of course, it's fair for me to assume that all th that all six of them will have, uh, will have um two will have at least two subclasses. Am, th am I correct on that? Yes, yes, that's that is our idea. We would like actually that when people play our campaign, each player ideally would choose one of the classes that we have designed, mm -hmm. because uh, they are actually thematically linked, and the actual powers that we've given them and the features are actually going to help them to fight all the enemies and the Mage Kalashramo, the Demis large monster, monsters, and all the Acolytes. So I think I think people will find them interesting, at least uh, these new classes that we've created. Mm -hmm. And when it comes to when it comes to mechan when it comes to mechanics, um, yes, one particular thing I'm interested in is um, Spectre. Yes. Is is that a is that a kind of reputation system for assassins? Uh, yes. Uh, this one's actually very linked to the city of Deepwell because, uh, as, you, as I was explaining before, the city of Deepwell is a dystopian like city, so mm -hmm. it's full of gangs, it's uh, assassins, there's uh, spycraft, there's all sorts of things happening. So the Spectre is the ideal character, the class to choose for for these more like stealth uh, attacks and combat. And with and with that with that kind of thing in mind, uh, what I did what I do find interesting, especially in, is something that plenty of plenty of modules have done over the years, but I don't see as many do it in Five E, and that is um, hex crawl support. A hex crawl, yes. Like, I'm a big fan of hex crawl. <laughs> like I've 
they hex crawls hex crawls were were is something that I've seen le I've seen less and less of um in D in D and D since since the since the days of third edition, and I was yes. there weren't as there weren't as many hex crawls in my opinion back in um eighty and D eighty and D second to my recollection. But with this one, so and given given that it's that you're doing a hex crawl, I'm guessing that there's plenty of tables for the GM regarding setting up encounters between hexes. Uh, did, did I lose you? Uh, as I was saying, Mildred, I'm a big fan of uh, hex crawls, and uh, I've enjoyed them in board games, role-playing games, e anything I can get my hands on. So I love the idea of that players could dynamically encounter random enemies, random locations as they explore the land of the case. It's such a vast island with ruins and tombs and temples. So I, I love the idea of actually generating these tables and that they encounter random enemies and, and, it's, and it's entirely optional as well, the hex crawl. If a game master doesn't want to actually offer it to the players, they, can, they don't have to either. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Now, one thing, I'd like to talk a bit on spell corruption, because, which I'm not, given the fact that you're going with dark fantasy, it didn't surprise me that this was a mechanic um, that was going to be used. I've seen this I've seen this in plenty of of dark fantasy games as a whole. One of my yes. one of my favorite, of co of course, being um, Blade of the Iron Throne. I haven't played that one actually. Blade of the Iron Throne is a successor to a to a to um, Riddle of Steel. Um, ah, Riddle of Steel, yeah, that rings a bell. That one, yes. Yeah, it's one of it's one of two games that was that's cons that could be considered a spiritual successor to Riddle of Steel. The other one being Song of Swords. Um, okay. It's and with and within that magic system, there is the risk of cor of um, corruption. You know, because with with sword and sorcery settings, magic is this da is this dangerous thing that yes. is akin to playing with fire. And yeah, the same. Yeah, the same in the Conan stories as well. Always magic was very dangerous, and Conan was always afraid of it. It's, it's a view I enjoy for stories as well. I, I love uh, low fantasy. Yes. Yeah. And within 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 these within your system, um, is it is it very much a case where there are where there are certain spells that people can find that are that ha that have this kind of corruption or is it something that every spellcaster is going to risk whenever they cast spells, period? No, it won't be like that. Of course, uh, as I, we, we talked about before, there's the Disciple of Ruin class, uh, there's uh, other classes as well, the Crusader. None of those spells will actually cause corruption. The only spells that will cause corruption are the ones discovered by the players in the ancient tombs of the Land of Decay. Because part of the story, Mildred, is that the players have to discover who was the ancient people that actually lived in these uh, monumental cities that are now buried beneath the ashen desert of this land of decay. Mm -hmm. And of course, within these tombs, there's going to be ancient scrolls and the chance to actually learn the ability of these powerful arcane spells. And those will actually cause corruption to the players that over time will affect them and cause afflictions to them, of course, that mm -hmm. uh, could affect them. So uh, they'll, they'll have to actually balance whether they do want to use these powerful spells when there's 50 crusaders or 20 crusaders about to attack them in a powerful sorcerer and if they do use it against those enemies they will have uh, a certain afflictions and tables that will affect them over time every time they use it yeah and the other the other thing I'm, the other thing I'm curious about when it comes when it comes to I know I know that there's a, when it comes to the when it comes to the module is that I know that there's a few um, monsters that you that you've demonstrated through the through the minis. Um, with when it comes to when it comes to the, when it comes to the um, when it comes to the more mundane um, enemies, just just with just with humanoids. Yes. Will will there be will the, will an effort be taken to make to make sure that those that those kind of enemies are ju are going to be just as special as. The, as the well ugly looking ones. 
<laughs> good point, good point. Yes, uh, well, I enjoy actually, every, I enjoy enemies that are actually thematic and are relevant to the story. For example, in the city of Deepwell, as we spoke about before, the enemies, who are they going to be? Well, there's the city guard, depending if you're on their side or not, they can become your enemies. There'll be, uh, there'll be the gangs located in Deep End, which is like the rough area of Deepwell. There'll be all sorts of gangs. And there'll actually be some sort of, I don't want to give away, but there is some sort of monster in the mines of Deepwell. There is creatures there that the players will have to have to deal with. Mm. And then in the Land of Decay, there will uh, Kalashroma, which is the evil wizard, let's say, of the story, the enemy, the nemesis. Well, he's actually raised an army, and uh, these are comprised of acolytes, who are the typical cult fanatics. Mm -hmm. There'll be crusaders, which are more the knightly warrior type. And then they'll have his own sorcerers. Uh, so the players are going to actually fight a variety of enemies. These are like the humanoid ones. But uh, monster-like, there will be plenty of those in the Land of Decay also. Depending on the locations and which tombs they dare open, Mildred. <laughs> yeah. And with, given given what you mentioned with the tombs, I'm, ge I'm, I'm guessing that once, th once that part has started, the, the, uh, to the tombs can be delved into in any order. Uh, yes, the idea is that the players with the story, I won't tell how they get there, but the idea is the players will have to find a way to reach this ageless city, this mythical ageless city. And once they reach the city, they will now see that this once majestic place now lies in ruins. And it isn't actually the, the ideal place of immortality that they thought there once was. Mm -hmm. So within the city, they're going to actually have to discover which the entrance to this tomb where the Colossus gods actually, uh, the, the statues, they're like, you know, the, where they're delving. Mm -hmm. And then the players will actually have to do now the dungeon crawling part and discover, avoid traps, avoid enemies, Kalashromo's army. And it'll be, like you said, a race against time. And uh, they can actually do it in any order, actually. They can fight these large Demis monsters that are part of the stories. Yeah. I think it'll be a good part. I think it'll be a good opportunity for the game master to actually make it time sensitive and give that sense of urgency. The way I'm writing it and designing it is, is I don't want it to be very long, the Tomb of the Colossus Gods, that part. The end part should be this race against time to restore time to the Ageless City, destroy the, the monsters, and, and defeat the, the Mage Kalashramo before he awakens the Colossus Gods. Yeah, which ties, ties into something that a colleague of mine has said when it comes to... When it comes to when it comes to film, that I think can apply just as well to tabletop campaigns. Yes, and that is the the ideal the ideal the ideal um the ideal plot. When it comes when it comes to when it comes to these sort of adventure stories, has has a holy trinity of aspects that you need that you need to have and have well, a goal, stakes, and urgency. Yes. And I think this is a classic case of of the of that. And if you if you need an example of the of the of the concept of goal stakes and urgency, um, just just look at um, in, just look at say Infinity War or Dead Man's Chest. Those are. I haven't those seen are Dead Man's Chest actually. Infinity War, I have. Yeah, those are three examples where you have where you have a clear and present um, presentation yeah. of all three of those. At all, at all, at all times. Um, one thing I'm cu one thing I'm curious about is in the Kickstarter page you mentioned you mentioned a book of whispers belonging to Demastrius. Um, yes. Is it would it be a case where th where the party would ha would have this book as as a um, clue as a clue or is this um, something that's going to be used in universe in the book? Exactly what you said. It is like sort of a clue-giving book. The idea of the Book of Whispers is that uh, once the players uh, reach Deep Well, complete the quest, and uh, the main quest line starts when the Mage Damasha sets them on this quest mm -hmm. to find the Ageless City, he was going to grant them his Book of Whispers, which is sort of like his uh, memoriam, you know, of his travels through the Land of Decay. Mm -hmm. So this gives a little bit of context to the player. So when the game master is actually, the players reach a new location, sort of like the Green Lagoon or the Bone Marshes, mm -hmm. the player can, uh, the game master, sorry, can actually read as the voice of Demastrius uh, the location of what Demastrius thought of the place and any clues or secrets uh, that he can may give to the players and hints. Mm -hmm. 
I thought it was like an interesting mechanic to open it up so the players don't just uh, keep uh, traveling this land of decay and randomly finding a tomb and all that. It gives a little bit of context for the different locations. Not everywhere, but uh, quite a few of the main locations. Yeah. And one of the stretch goals, actually, Mildred, is if you saw the tra- if you saw and heard the trailer, actually, we used the the voice actor Chris Lines, who has a, a really good voice, and he's actually speaking as the Mage Demacius. So, if actually this stretch goal is achieved on the campaign, we're actually going to create like a forty-five minute to an hour audio mm-hmm. with all the different audios divided, so that actually the game master in session can actually play the voice of Demacius with the voice of Chris Lines to make it even more thematic to the players. So they will hear this great voice of the actor Chris Lyons speaking as Demastrius, explaining all the locations. So I think that's uh, quite a you know a cool different stretch goal, I think. It's a bit different. Mm-hmm. And as an as an as an aside with that, I do I do like the I do like what I saw what I saw of the um of the character sheet for to, for Tomb of the Colossus Gods. Um it it having a having a very tome like appearance and in a weird way yes. kind of reminds me of the character sheet for Conan two D twenty. Oh, okay, yes, yes, I've got Conan two D twenty. Yes, great, yeah, great RPG that as well. Very crunchy. <laughs> yeah, and it, and it's well, I I like the fact that they were willing to work with the with converting some of the um some of the mongoose material. Yes, uh, actually, I read some of the PDFs online, but I don't have the Mongoose. Mm-hmm. I know that's the original before actually Modiphius took over, isn't it? And now they've just produced, uh, I, I don't know, ca- 20 or 30 books, haven't they? I haven't stopped I producing these. The, I wouldn't call it the original because before okay. that, T- <laughs> TSR, had a br- TSR had a brief stint with doing a Conan RPG um, that, would li- that, would later be re- that would later be reincarnated as Zephyrs or Zeb's fantasy okay. role playing system. Um, it would utilize that same, um, that same D one hundred column thing that uh, Mar- that Marvel TSR did. Okay. Um, there were a cu- there were a couple D and D modules that used Conan, but they weren't very good. <laughs> so. <laughs> and you thought that the character sheet that we've created is similar, no, to the Conan one, the new one by Modiphius, then, yes. Yeah. It it has it has that same it has a similar a similar vibe and a, and just just a just a direction in how in how it works. Yeah, what I was thinking it was a bit uh, different actually because as you know most uh, character sheets in D and D are vertical, aren't they? Yeah. I thought it'd be interesting for the the players to actually have on their table like if it's because I love board games as well. I'm a big board game fanatic of dungeon crawlers. Mm. I love the idea of this character sheet that almost looked like a game board. And you could see clearly everything, and so that the players can actually have it in front of them and have everything very clearly, you know. And it's actually a yeah. form fillable uh, character sheet, so the players will be able to fill it up very easily and put any image they like as the as their character or the hero. Yeah. And I think uh, I can't wait for people to try it and give it the feedback. Also, of course. Yeah, the on- I'd say the only the only um, the only game I can think of that does that does that really does a whole lot of. Um, horizontal uh, horizontal design was the controversial Warhammer Fantasy Roleplay Third Edition. Um, though that though that w- that arguably went too far, went leaned too far into board games, depending on who you ask. And oh, yeah, um, and some some takes on Powered by the Apocalypse have dipped into that, especially with the playbook design. Okay, I'll, I'll have to check those out. I, I, I do like the idea of blending a, a bit of the board game and that, but like you say, maybe sometimes you can go actually too far when people want to play a role-playing game and mm-hmm. sometimes though they want to play a, a board game, it should be separated, no? Mm-hmm. And as I, as I understand it, you're go, you're you're going for you're going for around four hundred pages with the with the book. Yes, and. What would you be shooting for as far as a release window? Not a not a hard date, but a but a window. Well, actually, uh, half of the book actually has already been written, Mildred, and a lot of art actually been created. And there's actually over 30, 30 battle maps included that I've already created. Like over ten or twelve of them already have been fully created. Mm-hmm. So we put the window as uh, the ma- the estimated delivery as October of this year, Mildred. But I think actually maybe we could. Uh, 
deliver it in in summer possibly depending on actually how the art advances and everything advances i would like to actually give it uh before to the backers you know mm -hmm. so that they, they could play in summer maybe you know mm -hmm. yeah so so i could so i could play in nicer weather <laughs> that would be better yeah not <laughs> minus uh, degrees that you are now eh? <laughs> yeah i would like that for summer uh we, we've been working very hard since uh full production since uh last february mm -hmm. so it's been a full year of creating the kickstarter writing the book creating battle maps the miniatures so everything's actually well ahead on production it just depends now you know how the world is the situation nowadays so we do have to have a bit of uh, patience you know with printers with manufacturing so it all depends on them but the writing of the book will be completed in less than two months. Every day I'm writing Mildred, it's non-stop. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, it's like the second coming of NaNoWriMo, and I don't even do NaNoWriMo. <laughs> but with, but with, that se with all that said, I would like to sincerely thank you for taking the time out of your schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the madness at play here. It was lovely to join the monastery for today. I'll, I'm sure I'll, yeah. I'd love to come on another time and discuss how the project's doing. <laughs> mm -hmm. And because anytime you see fit to return, the door is always open. As I often say around here, drinking is not mandatory, but it is encouraged. Okay, we'll, we'll take note. <laughs> <laughs> and of course, a sincere thanks goes out to everyone who took the time out of their schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the madness. And there'll be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here on the open bar of the internet. But until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra, I am your gaming monk, stay fucking frosty, everybody! <laughs>